we talk about the Internet of Things, what we mean is computers gathering information by themselves. So in the 20th century, in the 1900s, computers only got data from people, typically people using keyboards. In the 21st century, it's become possible for computers and therefore machines to understand the world around them by themselves. Your smartphone has about 10 sensors. It knows where it is. It knows which direction it's going. It knows whether it's moving. It knows what the ambient temperature is. It knows what the barometric pressure is. You don't have to tell it any of these things. And that allows a number of applications. So one, one application that's an Internet of Things application that a lot of people don't think about as an Internet of Things application is Uber, the ride-sharing service. Uber could not work if people did not have smartphones that knew their location. Uh, and you can also see why the internet's important in the Uber application, because your smartphone knows where you are, there's somebody willing to give you a ride, their smartphone knows where they are, that information goes into the internet, uh, and at, at Uber there's a piece of software that finds the nearest driver for you and gets you there. And that's a very simple example of how internet-connected sensing delivers value. So the, the, the term, the Internet of Things, like, was just the title of a PowerPoint presentation that I, I made in 1999. And the problem I had, I was a junior executive at the Procter & Gamble company, which is this huge multinational consumer goods company from the US. And uh, I had figured out that to solve some of our supply chain problems, we really needed to put little microchips in all our products. Uh, and I had to explain that to senior executives who didn't have very much time, weren't very technical. Uh, but I knew that they understood the internet was a big deal in the 1990s and they were very excited about it. So I wanted to get the word internet into the title of my presentation to grab their attention. Um, and so the way I did it was I, the internet of things. At the time, I don't think anybody was talking about the internet of anything. It was just the internet. So I kind of just stuck these words on the end. Uh, probably I should have said the Internet for things, actually. It would have been more grammatical. But I said the Internet of things. Uh, and the presentation was successful, and they gave me some money to go do some research at MIT. And I gave the presentation again and again for many years. And I guess the, the, the term just stuck. So it was a very accidental, very accidental thing. So the Internet of Things has... has uh, has unfolded in some ways much faster than I thought it would and in other ways much, much more slowly. Um, you know, we got a lot of things right in the, in the late 1990s and early 2000s about the importance of having computers able to gather their own information and the value of, of sensing things automatically. Um, and so one example of, of the people use every day that they don't think about anymore is, is GPS. It's hard almost to remember how we used to get around without like having a map in our car that was interactive, that knew where we were. Um, we've taken that very much for granted, but that's an example of computers sensing something for themselves, in this case location, and then delivering a very useful application with that information. So uh, in, in many ways we got things right, right? We saw that it would be very valuable to have automated sensing. Um, what was completely unforeseeable in, in the late 1990s and early 2000s was the rapid advance we'd have in wireless technology. There was no Wi-Fi. To get on the internet, you had to plug in. Um, cellular telephony was really quite basic and wasn't very good for data uh, at that time. So the, the incredible advances in, in those kind of technologies are far faster than, than we expected. In other areas, things have been a lot slower. I, I predicted many times that we would have these radio frequency identification tags in, in consumer products by now. Um, and they're in some products, they're used in some applications, but the, you know, the consumer goods industry has been very slow to adopt that kind of technology. And it's, it's not for technical or economic reasons, it's, it's really kind of for political reasons. It's, it's figuring out who pays and figuring out who gets the data and stuff like that that's slowing things down. So I think the overall lesson is conceptually, uh, we got a lot right back in the 1990s uh, and, and the technology, if anything, has improved much faster than we thought it would. Uh, some of the human factors have, have taken a lot longer to kind of unfold than we expected. The Internet of Things is really like a hundred year project and 
we're kind of into the 17th year. And I, I don't think it's going to be a, a linear progression. I think we'll see things continue to increase in terms of the impact that the Internet of Things has. So you're, you're going to see impact everywhere there are things, which is kind of everywhere. Um, but some of the most visible transformations uh, I mean, have been things like the smartphone and sensing on the smartphone. Um, I think what's coming next, the, the big visible transformation everyone will notice will be in, in transportation. We're going to see a rapid deployment of self-driving vehicles, uh, both for you know, passenger vehicles like cars, but also commercial vehicles like trucks. Um, and so in the next 20 years or so, there'll be this huge transformation in transportation. And the interesting thing about that to me is when you look at history, if you see changes in transportation, you see massive changes in society and massive changes in geography, meaning how human beings use land. So we have a, a really exciting couple of decades coming. When I think about the Internet of Things, I, I don't think about it in terms of devices as much as in terms of, of sensors. Okay? So every smartphone represents eight to ten networked sensors. And there are about 10 billion smartphones in the world or something. Right? So that's 100 billion sensors right there. So um, the, the challenge with data and data analysis is really the, the, the most interesting aspect of the Internet of Things right now. Because we need more and more software that will analyze that data for us. Uh, using a technology that some people call artificial intelligence, I prefer to call it machine learning, um, which is really having a, a system look at data, find patterns, uh, figure out whether the patterns it's found are meaningful, uh, and if they are, like learn to do that more, and if they if they have false positives in them, you know, learn not to make that mistake again. That's what we mean when we mean machine learning. The the only way to handle this data coming from the Internet of Things and all these tens of billions of sensors is with better and better algorithms, better and better software. Um, and right now, that's one of the hardest things to do because there are so few people who know how to do it. Um, people who are experts in machine learning today are in huge demand because there are so few of them. But as, as more machine learning experts enter the workforce and as we learn more about how to analyze data algorithmically, uh, we'll see better and better solutions to turning big data into big value. Whenever you talk about the Internet of Things, uh, privacy is one of the first things people want to know about. And, and I think it's, it's worth understanding what I mean by privacy, first of all. Privacy is the ability to determine who sees your information. So you may want to share some information with some people, uh, and you know, not with the world, or not with certain people. That's that's what privacy is. It's it's kind of discretion around data, um, and there are a couple of components to providing people with with privacy. Um, the first one is helping them understand what data is being captured and how it's going to be used. If you don't do that, you're not giving people the choice of how, they, how their data is used. And this is a big problem right now. So there are a lot of Internet of Things systems, like uh, these in-home microphone systems, for example, where you, you, know, you, you ask a device to order you some milk or something, right? Um, people don't understand that those are listening all the time. They have to be listening all the time, because otherwise they won't hear you when you, when you tell them you need some milk. So um, communicating what a, what a technology does and what happens to the information that it gathers is very important. Uh, today, the, the way that is handled is with these, these complicated terms and conditions. You know, whenever you <coughs> want to use any kind of data service, you have to check this box that says, I read the terms and conditions. And you didn't read the terms and conditions. And, and nobody reads the terms and conditions, and if you did read them, you wouldn't really understand what they were trying to tell you anyway. They're, they're designed to be obscure. So you know, my view is the first thing we need is uh, kind of like a privacy label on a product, a little bit like we have a nutrition label on a food product, right? It tells you how many calories and what ingredients. Well, we need a very simple, easy to understand and, and clearly regulated way for consumers to understand what data is being gathered by whatever technology they use. 
Um, beyond that, there's another problem, which is even if I promise to keep your, your data private, I have to be able to deliver on that promise with good security technology, good security technology properly implemented. Um, and that's turning out to be challenging for a lot of governments and corporations today. Uh, the technology exists to keep data secure. The technology exists to keep data very, very secure. But uh, a lot of corporations and governments don't use it. They don't implement it properly. They take shortcuts. And those shortcuts lead to vulnerabilities. So to my mind, everything around privacy and security is in the realm of policy, either government policy or corporate policy. It's are you doing the things you could be doing to keep people's data private? And sooner or later, the organizations that don't do it are going to suffer because people won't buy their products or won't vote for those governments anymore.